Hi, my name is George English. I'm the Director of Research Through People, the Family History Service. So what we're going to look at this time is that very fascinating question, where does my surname come from? And particularly, how does that help in finding your ancestors? So let's have a look at the where the surname might come from. And if you go back in time, most Britons know that uh, William the Conqueror came over in 1066. There were no surnames then. They've all developed since. And they fall into one of four main classes. Local place surnames, official name is toponymic place name, but they may be to do with all sorts of places or features. And you see common names here, hill or wood, London, Glasgow, places like that, the towns and villages and so forth, and nationality, English and Scot. And basically the surname was something that evolved, that distinguished that person from other people. They lived near the hill or wood, they were from London and so forth. Surnames of relationship, obviously, if someone was uh, the son of someone. And interestingly enough, it varies slightly in England, they tend to add son on, as in Johnson. In Scotland, Mac means son, so that goes in the beginning, MacDonald, and in Ireland as well. In Wales, what they tend to do is just make a plural name, Jones, Williams, and so forth. And in Ireland, O'Brien is frequently used. Then there are occupations. What distinguished the person was they were a, a smith, a blacksmith, a tailor, a baker, a slater, and so forth. An obvious distinguishing feature. And lastly, nicknames, all sorts of types and things. Brown, they had a dark complexion. Short, strong, etc. Campbell means twisted mouth. So there are all sorts of ways, and you look at these names, look at them, virtually none of these could not be adopted by a lot of people who were not related. Do not assume because your surname is the same as someone else that you must be related. So no blood relationship just because the name is the same. But of course, there may well be. Where does our origin... Where do surnames come from? As I say, the, the, when William the Conqueror came over, there were no surnames. Gradually, they were introduced by the Norman barons, particularly when they were given land in England, and they tended to call uh, their name after the land they had, or possibly from where they came from back in France or, or, or wherever. And they, so, in other words, the nobles first got names, and then officials and lawyers found it useful because they could identify the person very clearly, and then they gradually extended it to people who had no land. Now, sometimes the surname was obvious, but it was a system that evolved. There was no official guidance on what you should do. Like so many things, fashion played a part. Convenience. And gradually the surnames extended and extended, and that system of the father's surname passing down to the children was in general use by the 1300s, so something like six, 700 years ago, most of our surnames were being used. And what's amazing, really, you think about it, what a fantastic, robust system that has stood the test of time. We are able to very clearly identify people from way back or from now because of the systems of names. So let's look at a bit more detail at the types of surname. I mentioned local surnames to do with the place or feature. So feature, so things like hill, wood, moor, you can imagine the person lived on the outskirts of the village by the hill. As simple as that it might be, and they became known by that name. Uh, locality in place, many, many examples of this. London, Glasgow, you could go through the, the map almost and just pick out names that are surnames. If you're in America, some of your most famous presidents, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, were named after places in England. Sometimes an estate, people who live near an estate, just like a town or village, took that name. And then in a similar vein, nationality. And you didn't get called Scot or English in Scotland or England. You got called it because you were living elsewhere and that distinguished you. I've had a lot of look at the Flemish people and people who came over to Scotland and England. And by and large, if you're called Fleming, you came over without a surname and then you were given that surname when you were living over here. So second type of thing is relationship. Now, patronymic fieldsick, these are things, obviously, that to do with the, the patron, the surname. Fealtic means loyalty. And so let's look at this. I've mentioned it earlier that typically with the relationship, the son of John, the son of Donald, son of John, the son of Brian in different countries, very common type of surname. Fealtic is interesting because, of course, in Scotland in particular and in Ireland, there's the clan system 
whereby there's the clan, say the MacDonald clan, there are the blood descendants of the actual MacDonald clan um, hierarchy, but there's a lot of people who were in a sense adopted or adopted the clan. They were not blood relations, but they were protected by the clan and they gave their services to the clan. And that happened a lot with servants as well. Servants of nobility very often took the name. But key thing, not a blood relationship, so don't assume that. Nicknames are just a whole raft of examples of this. So was it some physical or moral characteristic that distinguished the person? They were brown, dark complexion, short, strong. I mentioned Campbell earlier, crooked mouth, crookshank, uh, twisted leg um, in Scotland. Animals and birds, you think about, do you know some are called bull or lamb or finch? And then there's all sorts of other things, seasons of the year, summer, festivals, oath, and, and even obscenities. So fascinating. But again, very little, very few surnames which someone could not adopt without being related to that person. And what we do in our reports, we, we try and have a look at the surname and see if we can give you a bit of help on that. So that's a couple of recent examples I picked out here. Someone called Dick. Just as simple as that. A, a shortened version of Richard and one of relationship, clearly. Wood burn in Scotland. The burn is the stream. So the person lived by the wood burn. Most, and then we look at where is it most common? You can tell very often from the past whether it evolved. So found quite a lot in the northwest of England, and particularly in the Ayrshire on the west side of Scotland. Scott, an obvious name, means a relative of Scotland, a native of Scotland, sorry not, and most common on the Scottish-English border. And you can imagine Scottish people going and living in the north of England, being called Scott, and then maybe over time moving back to Scotland and so forth. And it's the tenth most common surname in Scotland. Very important thing, if a surname is very common, the odds of you being related are much less than if it's a very rare one. And I picked out one which is quite a rare name, Shirt. And we wouldn't immediately know that that's a place in the parish of Stockport in Cheshire. Um, but that case is interesting because that's a, a really rare name, much more likely if someone was called Shirt, that there might be a relationship. But we need to know a lot more before we can make that conclusion. I mentioned the Flemish thing. I've recently been involved for, for a few years in a project about Scotland and the Flemish people. The book has come out this year. It was there to examine the interaction between Flanders and Scotland over the year. And they ran a blog for a whole lot of times. So if you'd like to know more about surnames, I did a blog and one time on surname formation in Britain. If you just look to Google surname formation in Britain and possibly Scotland and the Flemish people, you should be able to read my blog and that will give you a lot more information. <clears throat> So, of course, what's crucial, you come to us and say, what are the chances of success? Of course, what kind of happens, there is a family belief that we're descended from someone, etc. So, if the relationship is in the last couple of hundred years from 1800, the chances of finding out whether that's true or not are good, because the records are good, the registration of births, marriages and deaths and so on. A lot of these family law things go back a lot further in time, before 1800. And a key problem there is that there are far fewer records. We talk about primary records that were recorded at the time, the baptism of someone or the birth, and secondary things that are recorded later, say like a census would record someone's age, but that's a few years after, etc. And far fewer records in general. In terms of status, the typical status that might be recorded was nobility, people who own land, but a lot of the things that we get these days just would not be recorded. The sort of records, the main source of birth, marriages and deaths, or baptisms, marriages, plans, burials, is the parish register. But sometimes we're looking at deeds, what sort of documents were there, legal deeds, fiscal deeds, and so forth that may play a part. And crucial in terms of whether there's some success here, the actual name, was it common or was it unusual? I can tell you if your surname is Smith, it's very unlikely you're related. Whereas if you've got a very unusual surname, there's a much better chance. And one of the good things in the past, people tended to stay in the same place. So we do occasionally come across situations where there's a name, a number of people over a number of generations with the same unusual name. We may not actually be able to prove, find the evidence of that connection, but it's a reasonable assumption that it is likely. And that's one of the key things. Let's form a balanced view based on the facts, on the evidence, not pluck something out of the air. So I mentioned this, we quite often get people come along and say, we're descended from royalty. And there can be sincere claims there, and there are some that were deliberately made up. 
Um, quite interesting, I was talking to the head of Scotland's people recently, and he was saying that quite often people come from overseas, and a lot of them claim that they were descended from Robert the Bruce in the 1300s, or the poet Robbie Burns. Um, and he said he even had someone who claimed they were descended from Greyfriars Bobby. Now, Greyfriars Bobby was a faithful dog of an owner. When the owner do died, Greyfriars Bobby was in Edinburgh and went along every day to the grave of his master. So unlikely there's a relationship there. Uh, we've had someone who actually claimed they were descended from a queen who had no children and could not bear children. Anyway, that's joking. What we try and do is someone comes along with a, we believe, we think we may, we have a serious look at it. And what I'm going to do is just take a, a, the most extreme example I've been involved in, um, which just shows you how you go about it. But equally the dangers if people claim that they're descended when it's just, just not true. Now, this is an example of someone called Philippe de Lanois who went over to America. The, you may know this is the 2020 is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower going to New England. And Philippe went over on the next ship, the Fortune, in 1621. His name was changed to Philip Delano. There are thousands of his descendants known about. There's a Delano Society. There's people like President Franklin Delano Roosevelt descended from that. And they originally came from Flanders, from a place called Tourcoing, which is near Lille is probably the place that you might know, now in France, but was then just over the border in Flanders. And de Lanois, you can see there was a little village called Lanois quite nearby. That is crucial in looking at this. But there we are, Flanders and the Low Countries. It wasn't then Belgium and Holland, mainly there were 17 smaller provinces and it was ruled by Spain. Anyway, um, Philippe de Lanois, his grandfather was called Gilbert de Lanois and he was from Torquin thought to be born about 1545 and two Delano brothers got together and did a fantastic bit of work in 1899 and they noted straight away the lords, the seigneurs in French of Torquay were also called de Lanois, there was a noble de Lanois family. So not unnaturally, perfectly reasonable to wonder if we are related to that family. And they claim descent based on the fact that they thought perhaps... So they've got a person called Delanois living in Torquay. They know nothing much about the Gilbert, but there's a noble family. And they thought, well, he would normally be living with the noble family. Why would he not? And very occasionally, there's examples where someone who turned Protestant, this was during the Reformation, was disinherited by their Catholic parents. And there's an example with, with, with Louis XIV, in fact, so he claimed that the descent from the noble Jean de Lanois um, because of changing his religious faith. And that was one reason he found six other reasons, totally speculation, no evidence as such, to claim that that was the case. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, he was being sincere. He wasn't trying to make it up. He said, well, this is all the evidence I've got. So what should have happened was that someone with knowledge like ourselves, expertise, should go on and look at the evidence. But I got involved more than a hundred years later, a few years ago. Over a hundred years, people had believed this. Uh, some had not, of course, etc. But it was still being talked about, and yet no one had gone and actually found out what the facts were. So who might be Gilbert de Lanois' father? Now, the thing you need to do in this case is look at both the person who's claiming the ancestry, and then the person with whom they're claimed to be related. So, first thing to do is to say, well, what type of surname is de Lanois? And it jumps out immediately, if you know about it, that de Lanois is a place name type of surname. Lanois is a few miles away from the nearby town of Lanois. There is, of course, the noble family, but you cannot assume that because our names are the same, we're descended from that. There's also the case here where there were servants of the de Lanois family who might have taken that case. So we immediately know there's more than one way that you can get the name de Lanois. So let's look at this place name. And straight away we examined, I examined Torquin, there are 20, 80 districts and hamlets in Torquin. There were de Lanois in 20 of those districts. Research has been done much more recently, and in the département of Nord, which uh, 
talk around is now in. It's the ninth most common surname. So it's like having a name like Taylor or Jones. And you immediately know there have been lots and lots of the Landras with the place name to try and conclude that this particular individual is descended from nobility. It's just, oh, I say non-starter. You can never be totally sure, but you, you would normally just dismiss this at that point. But there's a lot more to that, looking at the noble family. And the good thing about the noble family, their ancestry was well documented. And there was Jean. He had four children that recorded. The claim here was that with the disinheritance, the all records were released, uh, were deleted. There was no Gilbert, but the children are born in the early 1530s. The Delano person said, I think Gilbert was born about 1545. So he'd only been 11. Change religion and disinherited at that point. And the reason he said that was he thought there'd been a siege in 1556. Now, I looked at this, looked at the history, no siege. And what I realized, he had mistranslated the French word siege which also means seat or headquarters of the family. There was no siege. And there are lots of other things I won't go into here, but the, the case should be dismissed should have been dismissed a long time ago. Bordering on certainty that the father was one of with the unrelated place name. Use bordering on certainty, because without an actual document, a, a birth or baptism record saying, here's the father, okay, it is a possible thing, but the odds of that are very, very slight. And you certainly would not claim that ancestry. Now, just look at one other dimension of this. He then researched all the Delanois, the noble Delanois, going way back to the 12th century and had this claimed American line. I've just put the main names here. There's Gilbert. He claimed his father was the noble Jean Delanois, goes back to Hugh Delanois. And then a female Delanois, it's claimed married into the de Franchimon family, which goes back to the... Now, the royal claim, there are six royal lines claimed. All of them were to do with the Franchimon family or wives of, the Delanois did not have any known connection to royalty. So again, question marks come up. Now basically, if you, if a connection with a particular ancestor is broken, then of course everything before that goes on. But in terms of this, the reason I put a line here is that over a hundred years ago in 1906, I found someone had found four documents which proved that Jean de Franchimont did not marry Mahin. De, de Lanois. So that claim to the link with the, the Franchimon family had been disproved over a hundred years ago. But it was only a few years ago that I found the actual proof because it was printed in... Because this is more difficult. If you're sitting in America, of course, the information is in Europe. And it was actually a Belgian person who'd found this information in 1906. So that royal claim was disproved immediately. <clears throat> and then we come to Jean de Lanois. And in fact, he was not the Lord of Torquay. It was his younger brother. And he's not known to have gone to Torquay. So immediately, not only we almost disprove this before you start, but we get this situation where it is not total fabrication, or not deliberate fabrication, but it is clearly fabrication. It's not something you would put any evidence and weight on. And the shame is, a lot of people have believed that over the last hundred years. And we spent a lot of time, I mean, Delano went to Chile, and someone there wrote a great book, not only with the de Franchimont and de Lange, but with the royal people, Charlemagne. The Delano Society, when I joined, had the claim to Charlemagne still up there, etc. Evidence is so important. So there's an example, I don't want to make too a point, but, but we'd be delighted if you want to come along. I doubt if your claim or whatever is as um, detailed or interesting as that in a way, but we, we can find information. Sometimes we come back to you and say, we proved it's true. Sometimes we proved it's not true. Quite often we have to say, the evidence is not there, but we can very often make a judgment it is likely or unlikely. So delighted if you want to get in touch, uh, but please feel free to do so. Here are our contact details, the website. Um, we have three packages, gold, silver and bronze. You can find information about that on the website. Uh, you can send us an email, info at... And if you get in touch as a result of this, we'll give you our 10% introductory discount. Just quote, explore one. Thank you. We look forward to hearing from you.